Uh, my name is Anna Nadolna, if uh, some of you are new and don't know me yet. I'm a member of 40th Polish Polar Expedition to Spitsbergen and I work here as a meteorologist. But as for my education, I am a geographer uh, with a specialization in hydrology. So uh, actually, I'm a hydro hydrologist and I live and work uh, at the Polish Polar Station Hornsund on Spitsbergen. And uh, today I will tell you also a little bit about how I got here. Okay, so I bet some of you might think uh, about becoming a polar researcher just like me. Um, so you've seen the pictures, watched the videos, read about it uh, online and in books, and now let's say you've decided you want to actually become a polar researcher. Well, you want to experience the polar regions more fully, more closely, and most of all, during winter months in the places where, well, usually no other tourists can visit. So, is it difficult to, to become a polar researcher? Well, let me be uh, an example. I'm small <laughs> and uh, I don't have uh, much strength. I wear glasses and, well, here I am. So, let me tell you, this is actually possible. Um, okay, so let's start with a question for you. How do you think? What personality traits should a polar researcher have? How do you think? Okay, maybe I will help you. So, here are some of the personality traits uh, that I chose that I think are quite important. So, um, a polar researcher uh, should be, uh, in my point of view, uh, a person who is, first of all, uh, who has, first of all, ability to solve problems, as you may encounter many, uh, many small and big problems here in, in the polar regions. Uh, it's a person who is, uh, well, some sort of brave, flexible, uh, creative, open-minded, versatile, uh, autonomous, tolerant, uh, a person who has a sense of humor, uh, who is adaptable, uh, undemanding, and mentally resistant. And I think all of that, and probably many other uh, personality traits, one of the most important is to have a sense of humor, to have the ability to solve problems, and to be creative. Okay, and adaptable. That's also quite uh, useful here. It's, uh, it's important because you have to remember that uh, you will spend... Uh, probably one year in a very distant place uh, with uh, a small group of people that won't be changing uh, and, will, and which will be closed in, a, in a one building, for example. So um, you have to keep that in mind. You have to also remember that during the recruitment process uh, for Polar Station, personnel uh, are screened carefully for their psychological and physical suitability uh, to work in the demanding cold polar uh, environment as uh, those people have to be in very good physical shape uh, as full medical facilities are usually far away and sometimes it takes really a long time to get there uh, especially if you go to Antarctica. Okay, so uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about where you actually could work as a polar researcher. Well, that's, of course, uh, either Arctic in the north or Antarctic in the south. Uh, as you can see on this map, uh, this is a map of uh, not all stations that are in the Arctic, but uh, the let's say the most important ones. Uh, I can tell you that in, in the Arctic there is uh, almost 100 station, stations uh, which are directed by countries all over the world. Uh, so that's quite a lot of uh, opportunity to, to, to work there. 
but you have to remember that even though there is so many stations uh, from so many countries, still there is quite a lot of people who want to get there. So it's not so easy uh, to become a part uh, of uh, such such uh, group. Uh, among all of those stations, there is also a Polish uh, po station, uh, Antar Un Polish Antarctic station Artstowski. I wasn't there, but who knows, maybe one day I will also try to, to get there when I will go back to Poland. And here you can see the map of the most uh, important uh, stations in the Arctic, so in the north. Uh, they are not, uh, there is not as many stations in the north as you have in the, in the Antarctic, but still there is over 40 stations in the Arctic. Uh, among which uh, there is uh, my station, so Polish Polar Station Horizont, we are here. Uh, yes, so plenty of opportunities. And here I listed to you uh, an example of uh, uh, countries who that uh, have the national or Antarctic programs. Uh, so this is just an example. I will uh, get back to this slide at the end of our uh, lesson, so you could uh, write down the addresses if you if you are interested in. As you can see, uh, many countries have have their uh, Antarctic or Arctic programs, including Poland, uh, South Africa, uh, Italy, uh, or, or many other countries. For example, China, Japan, or, or India. Uh, so, there's always a chance to find a, a, a polar program in your own country. Okay, so what are the options if you want to go to a polar station? We could divide that into two groups. First would be the time that you will spend at the station. So, uh, you could uh, go and over winter which means you were gonna you're going to spend at least one year at the station uh, because the time that you will spend there depends from the station for example uh, on the Halle 6 station that can be uh, almost 18 months uh, in case of uh, Polish Polar Station Hornsund that's 13 months so the length uh, depends uh, from the station uh, that you will apply to. But you can also go only for the summertime, uh, which means you will, uh, you will have the opportunity to spend a few months uh, during the summertime uh, on a station. Uh, the length of that period also depends on the station. Uh, in Hornsun, that's three months. Uh, in Artstowski, that's, uh, as far as I remember, six months. So there are these uh, different options. And also the, the second group that we could uh, talk about is the station crew. So you can go either as scientific staff or as a technical staff. Uh, scientific positions uh, are in reality the job of the base uh, because without them there would be little or actually no need for the station at all. Uh, polar researchers uh, usually are uh, at a minimum of uh, postgraduate level if, if we talk about the scientific stuff. But also there is this opportunity to work uh, uh, as a technical staff so there are some support positions or trades uh, that fall into a whole range of occupations that are involved with the tasks uh, of keeping the base uh, and its personnel in good shape so that it will be possible to perform duties safely and efficiently. Uh, these positions uh, usually require people who are experienced in their particular field and almost always with uh, relevant uh, professional qualifications. So um, the important information for you is that you actually doesn't have to be a scientist to get to a polar station and become a polar researcher. Okay, so now another question for you. How do you think? What people are needed? What uh, 
positions uh, you can think of uh, what positions there are on the polar stations what people they are looking for what like uh, let's say maybe a plumber or a driver or maybe um, chemists or geologists how do you think you can write your ideas uh, on the chat box and I will show you in a minute what are the options. Researcher, yes, uh, definitely they they need some researchers. But uh, what uh, what with what specializations? A specialization would be, for example, uh, geology, or let's say um, biology. You have to keep in mind that uh, polar personnel are specialists uh, in a particular field. Uh, as I said before, these include both scientists and support staff. So uh, the answer to my question would be this list. Um, they are not close, let's say, because uh, Actually, there are really a lot of opportunities for very different brands to, to, to get to the polar station. So as for the scientific stuff, uh, that would be uh, most of all glaciologists, uh, geologists, biologists, zoologists, meteorologists, physicists, oceanologists, geophysicists, IT experts, hydrologists, chemists, land surveyors, and trust me, so, some uh, some more, <laughs> uh, depending from the station and uh, the program, uh, the research program that is uh, conducted on uh, chosen station. As for technical staff, uh, that would be chefs. So if you are cooking very good, you can apply. Uh, of course, mechanics, electricians, medical doctors, carpenters, builders, mechanical services technicians, electrical services technicians, technical workers, administrators, diving officers, boat handlers, conservators, and so on and so on. So as you can see, there are quite a lot of opportunities, not only for people who are um, in the scientific um, uh, world, but also for people who are simply good at what they do. Uh, so as you can see here, there is a really wide, wide variety of specialists that are needed on polar stations. And uh, you don't have to have a scientific background because technical experts are also essential for polar stations. And also you have to remember that on many bases, um, on many bases, uh, there is the expectation and uh, requirement that uh, all staff will fulfill general generalist um, roles such as unloading ships, washing dishes, night watches, cleaning the base, dealing with the trash, uh, and so on. And the smaller the base is, the more varied of these housekeeping jobs will be expected to do in addition to your own specialist task. 
And while recruitment, remember that it is uh, important to, to uh, well, having extra skills and experience is a really big advantage. So the more uh, extra skills you have, for example, you are a hunter, you know how to climb, you have some first aid courses, uh, that will be really useful while uh, applying for the job. So, how did I do it? Uh, well, if you want to become a polar researcher, well, the first step is to find the national pro polar program in your own country. Uh, why is uh, that? That's because it's the easiest option, because interviews will usually be held in that country and it will be in your mother language. Uh, also, you have to be aware uh, of that, that some countries uh, have a strong preference for their own citizens. So sometimes you may find the information that foreign, foreign nationals are simply not considered. In my case, uh, I found the information about uh, recruitment for a polar expedition to Spitsbergen. I have applied for the position of a meteorologist. That was in December, um, in December 2016. And uh, in January, I was invited for an interview. And two weeks later, I got the information that I can go if I will pass all medical examinations. And you have to uh, keep in mind that this is not an obvious thing. Uh, because every year few people drop out due to poor medical results and you have really a lot of medical examinations including psychological tests um, so it's not so obvious if you're gonna pass all, all of that but if you pass uh, as I did you start to prepare for the expedition uh, and with the rest of your uh, uh, crew, expedition crew, you usually go through many courses and trainings uh, and as in uh, my case in July uh, I started my life uh, in the Arctic with the with my expedition and this is how I got to speed again which is far beyond the Arctic Circle nearly uh, 3,000 kilometers away from my home in Warsaw and uh, uh, around 1,400 kilometers uh, from the North Pole. Uh, on an island uh, uh, of Spitsbergen, I started living in a station that is located within South Spitsbergen National Park, so in the southern part of the island, where which is uh, 140 kilometers away from the civilization. And where we can get only by a boat, uh, a helicopter, or by a snowmobile, uh, but that's only possible in the in the winter time. And this is how my uh, home, my polar home, look like. So that's our station. I have I have already spent here over eight months in this building. Third window from the from the left is uh, the window of my room. <laughs> And most of the time of that eight months that I've spent here, I've spent with only nine people because during the winter there is only 10 people at the station. That's a free meteorologist, free environmental observers, a geophysicist, IT expert, a conservator, and a mechanic. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of that people, about each of that positions, so that you could have the sense uh, what who is doing what at the station because everybody has uh, their role uh, and their uh, duties uh, at the station so let's start with our land surveyor um, <clears throat> who is uh, generally measuring how the glaciers uh, are moving and changing He's also measuring, for example, uh, the depth of the snow so that uh, it could be used for the calculation of uh, mass balance uh, and glacier change dynamics. And uh, he has to do his measurements uh, every week. Sometimes uh, all measurements have to be done on foot, which means that uh, you have to travel many kilometers uh, on the glacier 
uh, which usually cannot be done in one day because that's simply simply uh, too much. Uh, in the winter time, it's easier because uh, he can use snowmobile, uh, which makes things uh, much faster. But still, there is always the the danger of uh, falling into a crevice on a on a glacier. So, the job of a land surveyor here is quite quite dangerous. Uh, as I told you at the beginning, I work at the station as a meteorologist and uh, to be precise, as a meteorological observator. Uh, so now a few words about what I do here. Uh, with me, there are three observators at the station. Uh, that's because we have to make observation 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So we don't have uh, any breaks uh, or we don't have any... Um, uh, yeah, we don't have any breaks. <laughs> we do that 24-7. Uh, what we do? We mainly observe clouds um, and a number of other meteorological parameters such as, uh, for example, atmospheric pressure, wind, wind direction, wind speed, uh, air temperature and humidity, or, for example, sun duration. We are also responsible for maintaining the atmospheric science equipment uh, and quality of the data and uh, its transfer to electronic storage, of course. And every three hours we have to send uh, a coded uh, information to Norwegian uh, Meteorological Institute as they use our data for their uh, meteorological forecasts. Another uh, position at uh, Hornsen Station is a uh, position of a hydrochemist. Uh, a hydrochemist uh, is responsible for our year-round monitoring of the chemical composition of surface and precipitation waters. What does this mean in practice? Well, uh, that means that after every significant uh, rainfall or snowfall, the hydrochemist must go out and collect samples in the field. Sometimes it's every two or three weeks, but more often it's uh, every few days. And you have to keep in mind that a hydrochemist must uh, collect her samples for from whole glacier. So she uh, usually uh, go with our land surveyor, they go together in the field. And it's really time consuming. And uh, the work of a hydrochemist is not only to, to collect the samples, but uh, most of all to make all the chemical uh, analysis uh, in the laboratory which we have on our station, uh, which usually takes uh, at least several hours. So a hydrochemist is a pretty uh, busy person at the station. Uh, next position is the, the position of geophysicist. Uh, who is responsible for geomagnetic and seismic monitoring at the station because you might not know but we also have some uh, local F tremors uh, that we can feel here due to some plate tectonics uh, and glaciers uh, movement so uh, it really happens that we have some small uh, earth tremors here um, <clears throat> he, uh, geophysicist, uh, in our case, is also our main electrotechnician who deals with all cables and electronic devices if they broke down. If they broke down, so if we have any problems with with that, with the cables and so on, we go to our geophysicist, and uh, well, he he fixes the problem. Uh, oceanographer. So if you like water uh, and uh, you know how to operate a boat, uh, if you have the experience in use in using boats on on the sea or oceans, that's uh, something for you also. Uh, our oceanographer is responsible for monitoring of sedimentation processes and temperature salinity structure in our fjord hornsul. In practice, this means that he has to do his measurements every week 
uh, he is taking uh, samples and measuring salinity in all sampling points, which uh, usually takes two or even three days uh, of work, depending from the weather and ice conditions. And uh, after this uh, collecting of those samples, he has to make uh, analysis in his uh, laboratory, which takes uh, another well, few hours at least. Um, so it's also quite quite time consuming. Also, the oceanographer well has uh, a variety of uh, boating support tasks, including uh, dive support because uh, in the springtime uh, there will be a group of divers. So somebody will have to uh, take care uh, of them and to help them uh, um, to get to some places in the fjord. So that's the job of the ocean ocean oceanographer. Okay, another very important pay, uh, person on our station that is a uh, IT specialist. Uh, because, of course, we need that kind of, uh, of expert. Uh, IT specialist takes care of all our computer, laptops, satellite communication, radio antennas, internet, databases, and so on and so on. If not him, uh, we couldn't send the measurement data to worldwide networks like NASA. And, well, actually, we couldn't have this lesson because uh, there simply would be no connection. So IT expert is uh, a very important uh, person on the station. And uh, I think the more important person than the IT expert, so the most important position at the station, is actually the mechanic. Uh, because he provides us with the electricity. And without electricity, electricity uh, almost anything would wouldn't be possible to, to do here because the measuring equipment wouldn't work because we couldn't uh, send the data and uh, because we wouldn't have any heating here so uh, the conditions would be really difficult to 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 live here so main duties of uh, of a state Mission mechanic is of course uh, constant maintenance uh, and repair of our power engines, snowmobiles, and other vehicles. And uh, trust me, uh, the mechanic has really a lot of work, as in these severe Arctic conditions, things simply constantly break down. So he has hands full of full of work all the time. And uh, finally, the last person from our winter crew, so our conservator. Uh, a conservator is a person uh, who is uh, a kind of a handyman. So he uh, <clears throat> constantly has to make some small repairs in station buildings. Uh, he's also making furniture, for example. So carpenter skills are very desired in this position. He's uh, uh, responsible for operation, maintenance, and repair of all the water systems, sewage system, fire suppression system, domestic uh, appliances, fridges, freezers, and so on and so on. So really, um, he has to <laughs> be able to repair almost anything. And uh, yeah, that's that's typical handyman, polar handyman, let's say. Okay, but as I told you before, uh, you can also become a polar researcher only for the summertime uh, at Hornsuit Station. So, for example, all you have to do is to be a specialist in cooking. You can be a chef. Uh, during the summer, our station can be crowded as we can host almost 40 people at one time. So that's why a chef is really uh, a necessary person here. He or she has to produce a, a wide variety of dishes to suit group and to cater for any dietary or medical requirements. And uh, he is also uh, responsible for food uh, and equipment as 
acceptable as a star, star quotation. And of course, he has to clean the kitchen. <laughs> so, if you are a good chef, you can also become a polar researcher. Another person uh, which is very useful during the summertime while while we have uh, a lot of people on the station is uh, the administrator. Uh, in our case, that was uh, Carolina. Uh, you can see her on the picture with one of our dogs, Yuki. Well, uh, so yes, during the summertime station is crowded. Uh, a lot of people are coming and leaving, so somebody has to control control that traffic, as well as all the uh, equipment that is used by these people. So in the other words, that's the paperwork that has to be done. And a person that takes care of that is the administrator. And finally, a summertime is the time when station undergoes uh, main repairs, new measuring equipment is installed, buildings are renovated, or some grant work is done. Uh, that's why uh, usually we also need some technical team that uh, consists mostly of uh, three, four people. Uh, it's often a physical job, like on a construction site, uh, but again, that gives you a great opportunity to, to visit uh, this wonderful place and spend he here a few months, uh, which is also, I think, uh, a great uh, possibility. Okay, so uh, becoming a polar researcher is uh, not just about work. Uh, it is also a great experience, adventure, and I think a fantastic opportunity to explore distant polar regions. So as uh, I told you during this lesson, you don't have to be a scientist. You have to be simply a good specialist and have a little bit of luck while applying for the job. So what can I say? Uh, if some of you want to become a polar researcher, then I, I can tell you good luck with that. I keep my finger crossed for you. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, ask them now. <music>